Welcome to another episode of the laziest podcast in America, aka The Modern Moron. I have lost all desire to meet a self-imposed weekly deadline, obviously. I, again, do not have a guest, and I plan on putting as little effort as possible into this episode. In fact, I'm basically going to read you an article. Okay, I'm going to read you an article in this election week episode. Or is it an election week? Is it, or is it an election month? I'm going to go with election month because we sure as shit are not going to have a consensus by the end of the day or the week. And once a consensus is reached, you can be equally sure that outcome will be contested. Okay, I said I'm going to read to you. Not a bedtime story, although that would probably be a better bet. I'm going to read you most of an article published in, should I say where it was published? Uh, that'll instantly alienate some of you just by the source, won't it? Hmm. And oh, by the way, is this, uh, is this plagiarism and is this, uh, I guess, illegal to just flat out read someone else's work? Sure it is, but not for the three or four of us, right? Because nobody really listens to this. I'm not on the radar. I'm not Joe Rogan. Come on, folks. I'm a moron. Okay, how about the author? I can share that. The author is Arthur C. Brooks. He is a contributing writer at the... Whoops. And a professor of the practice of public leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. He is also a senior fellow at the Harvard Business School. He also hosts a podcast. Great. Another podcast you should certainly listen to before this one. His podcast is called... The Art of Happiness with Arthur Brooks. Great, fantastic. Let's all stop this and go listen to that. The article is titled, Reading Too Much Political News is Bad for Your Well-Being. Obsessing over politics could hurt your happiness and your relationships. I've got a couple of opinions to interject here and there, which is ironic because the entire problem this article focuses on is our extreme toxic attachment to our own opinions. All right. Here we go. Are you ready? Me neither. Of the many ideas from Eastern religion, oh, we're going to lose a bunch more there, and philosophy that have permeated Western thinking, the second, quote-unquote, noble truth of Buddhism, of Buddhism, arguably shines the greatest light on our happiness, or lack thereof. The second noble truth teaches that attachment, the concept of attachment, is the root of human suffering. Um... To find peace in life, we must be willing to detach ourselves and thus become free of sticky cravings, cravings and aversions, craving things that I want, trying to avoid things I don't want. This requires that we honestly examine our attachments. What are yours? Money? Power? Pleasure? Prestige? Dig deeper. Just maybe they are your opinions. The Buddha himself named this attachment and its terrible effects more than 2,400 years ago in one of his sutras, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, when he is believed to have said, those attached to perception and views roam the world offending people. More recently, the Vietnamese Buddhist sage, Thich Nhat Hanh, I hope I pronounced that right, wrote in his book Being Peace, humankind suffers very much from attachment to views. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't if you attached yourself to my views. I don't get it. As the election season heats up, in this case, it's this week, many Americans are attached to their opinions, especially their political ones, as if they were their life savings. They obsess over their beliefs like lonely misers and lash out angrily when they are threatened. Oh, I don't do that. This is the source of much suffering for the politically obsessed and everyone else. Fortunately, There are solutions, according to the author. Little research has been conducted on the direct links between happiness and one's attention to politics. The indirect evidence, however, is not encouraging. For example, Dutch researchers in 2017 conducted a study on how hard news that tends to provide a political perspective affects well-being. They found that on average, well-being falls 6.1% for every additional television hard news program watched a week. They explained this by noting the dominance of negative stories on such programs and the powerlessness viewers might feel in the face of all that bad news. It's difficult to imagine that stories about political news in America would have any less of a negative impact, especially given how fraught and contentious United States politics is right now. In an attempt to see more clearly how attention to politics is directly associated with life satisfaction, the author conducted an analysis using 2014 data 
from the General Social Survey. After controlling for household income, education, age, gender, race, marital status, and political views, the author found that people who were, quote, very interested in politics were about eight percentage points more likely to be not very happy about life than people who were not very interested in politics. That makes sense, right? The Dutch researchers' point about negativity and powerlessness might play a role here, but something even more important might be happening. The author believes that today's partisan climate, media polarization, huge, go back to the social dilemma, and constant political debates are interfering directly with the fuel of happiness. What is the fuel of happiness, according to the author? Love. Right? Good old love. To begin with, our growing focus on politics is driving what social scientists call political homophily. What political scientists call political homophily. And I did pronounce that correctly. It's too bad the senator isn't here right now. We'd love to hear that. That'd give us all a laugh, right? Have, 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 what, what was it? Well, I'm, I'm the, I, I, I did not in that popular, a uh, popularity. Just... Political homophily means assortative mating by political viewpoint. Why did he have to throw in assortative when he already has homophily in the same sentence? Come on. One big word per sentence. God damn it! You wouldn't catch our president throwing a bunch of big words in a sentence. He's a plain, straightforward communicator. Here I go. Don't be rude. Okay. Political homophily is mating by political viewpoint. Scholars studying online dating profiles find that political views are comparable in importance to education levels in choosing one's romantic partner. Presumably, this reflects a growing belief that people's votes are a proxy for their character and morals. Right or wrong, this is a joy killer. If politics is so important as to preclude romantic love where it otherwise might have blossomed, happiness will fall as a result. That is huge. I'm going to read it again, okay? This affects a growing belief that people's votes are a proxy for their character and morals. It is not. I spoke with, okay, now I'm going off topic, but presumably it'll be more personal. I spoke with someone, a friend in Wisconsin, very religious person, very Christian. And this person is going to, they told me they could not stand Donald Trump. Can't stand him as a person. They're going to vote for him. For one reason and one reason only. And that is for the abortion issue. They said they're going to go in, they're going to vote for him, and then they're going to go throw up. So, this gets down to character and integrity and I, I i finally it's gotten through to me and i've learned something hey, stupid. um i know shocking right this is what i have learned whenever i bagged on donald trump my main problem with him is his complete and utter lack of character and integrity character and integrity over and over and over again he lacks it he lacks it most of the people i know that i've believe it or not taken a little bit of time to listen to agree that Donald Trump as a person completely lacks integrity and character. They don't like him either. But I watch my words very carefully. So you Democrats out there that are saying, well, then how can you vote for him? Well, because he is in the party that supports, for lack of a better word, the pro-life agenda, the pro-life platform. I hate, I hate those terms pro-life and pro-choice. But you can't, as much as you may be in support of pro-choice, I hope you can agree that being pro-life is all about integrity and character and judgment and morals. It's all about it. Either side of that argument, that huge, huge argument that we in this country cannot get past, that huge argument, whichever side you choose, is all about integrity. How dare you tell a woman what she can and can't do with her body? Of course, I agree with that. That's integrity. That's an integrous viewpoint. How dare you? How can you possibly abort a human life? That lacks integrity. I agree with that. Either side of that issue is all about character and integrity. And that one issue will cause people to vote for Trump. 
And I can't argue with that. Again, most of the people I know that are voting for him thinks he's a f idiot. Top to bottom. One of my friends who's going to vote for him said he would cross the street to avoid him. It's the policies and the party. And, and, I, and that's discouraging too. I saw um, a sign that said, don't stop at the top, vote Republican, top to bottom. Or don't stop at the top, vote Democrat, top to bottom, which is basically telling people, don't look at all the issues and the measures and the, and the propositions. Don't look at them and judge them for yourself. Just blindly go with the flock. <laughs> Terrible. Okay, did I digress enough? Okay, what do we just talk? The last thing we talked about here was um, politics is contributing to mating. We're, we're choosing our partners based on their political views in, the, in dating profiles. Parents might also contribute to this amorous sorting. Three decades ago, when the author was on a path to marriage, they don't remember their mom or dad asking about their future wife's political views. Did your parents, when you were brought a, a, a girl or boy home, did they say, is he a Republican? Is he a Democrat? 20, 30, 40 years ago? Of course you didn't. Traditionally, that wasn't too important for most parents in America. In 1958, according to a Gallup poll, 33% of parents who were Democrats wanted their daughters to marry a Democrat. 25% of Republican parents wanted their daughters to marry a Republican. Not so in recent years. Those numbers were 60 and 63%. Double and more than double. That was in 2016. Can you imagine what they are now in 2020? It's not good, people, whether you're Democrat or a Republican. We're placing way too much importance on this stuff. Friendships and family ties are compromised by political disagreements as well. Are you listening, Senator? I was getting my hair cut. Polling data have shown that about one in six Americans stopped talking to a friend or family member because of the 2016 election. Can you imagine how much that's amplified for 2020? No doubt these were mostly cases where friends and family disagree. But even when people agree politically, expressing intense views or going on and on about politics, like me, Loser. harms relationships. A 2018 data analysis in the journal Political Opinion Quarterly revealed that even strong partisans dislike too much political discussion, even agreeable discussion. Shut the f*** up. I was saying that for myself. It says, beware, especially of in-laws. To quote the researchers, many people do not want their child to marry someone from their own party if that hypothetical in-law were, were to discuss politics frequently. In other words, these days you need to have the right politics for your beloved's folks, but you can't be too intense about it. It's a bit of a high-wire act. Finally, Retreating too far into one's own political bubble makes one more ignorant of the world. How many of us are guilty of that? Oh, I only watch CNN. Mistake. Oh, Fox News says, I don't give a shit what Fox News said. They're just as bad as CNN. Retreating too far into one's own political bubble makes one more ignorant of the world. A 2012 survey conducted by Fairleigh Dickinson University asked a sample of Americans about their news consumption habits and quiz them about U.S. and international political and economic events. They found that those watching the most partisan television news sources on both the left and the right were often less knowledgeable about world events than those who consumed no news at all. Whether partisan news sources can misinform us or not, they shrink our world. By engorging the political, they crowd out nearly everything else. They create a kind of tunnel vision that makes it easy to equate news with politics and pay little attention to what's happening in other realms. And thus, we become more boring. In summary, if you spend the election season glued to your favorite partisan news outlet, read and share political outrage on social media, and use every opportunity to fulminate about politics, you might become less happy less well-liked. Nobody likes you. <laughs> I'm definitely going to listen to this episode. Less accurate and less informed. 
The author is not advocating for everyone to stop paying attention to politics, of course. Good citizens are attentive and active in the political process. However, for quality of life's sake, yours and others, you would do well to put boundaries around the time and emotional energy you devote to politics. To this end, the author has three suggestions, and they are good ones. Number one, get involved instead of complaining. What a concept. Earlier this year, the political scientist Aiton Hirsch argued in The Atlantic that highly educated people who consume a ton of political news are making true progress harder in this country. So people like me, highly educated, okay, never mind, their appetite for constant indignation fuels an outrage industrial complex in media and politics and likely makes compromise harder. Quote, what they are doing is no closer to engaging in politics than watching Sports Center is to playing football, end quote. He recommends active local citizenship. Get involved in your community and working with others to push for positive change instead of just watching cable TV and ranting about it. Hmm. I think this episode is directed at one person, the senator. No, me. Hirsch recommends this for the good of the country. I recommend it for the good of your mental health and relationships. God, that's a good one. Number two, ration your consumption of politics and limit the time you spend discussing it. A key characteristic of addictive behavior is the displacement of human relationships by the object of addiction. A good way to gauge whether you have a problem is to ask, is this activity a complement to my relationships or a substitute? I am a very stable genius. In the case of politics, for many people, an honest answer would clearly be the latter. Hence the willingness to damage friendships and romances. Oh, I can't tell you how many romances I've ruined by talking about politics. The solution is to ration your consumption of politics and set proper boundaries around where you talk about it. The author recommends limiting the consumption of all news, not just politics, to 30 minutes a day unless news is your vocation, which for most of us is not the case. Much more than you might just be upsetting rather than informing yourself or at least becoming one of Hersh's hobbyists. Further, resolve to avoid political discussions during most non-political occasions. It may be hard at first, but I'd wager that eventually you will savor the respite, especially during election season when politics is everywhere. Number three, turn off ultra-partisan news sources, especially on your own side. In 2017, the website The Onion, which is one of my favorites, introduced a satirical current news talk show called Your Right. In it, the host feeds viewers their own beliefs and biases, assuring them that they are right and that those who disagree are stupid and evil. It's a parody, of course, but guess what? It's not. It captures the, a real reason why people often turn to partisan news sources. It brings emotional satisfaction to hear experts and famous people saying things you agree with. I just said whiff, W-I-F. <laughs> things you agree with <laughs> and denouncing those with whom you disagree. This has deleterious effects on your relationships and leaves you poorly informed. No. Once you step away for a while, you'll most likely start to realize how much of a moron you are. I'm a moron. I'm sorry. How much of your energy was consuming and how much better you feel without these influences. The author concludes, this fall is going to be rough as in right now, politically. The election will be brutal and bitter. There's no way to avoid this. But Americans have to decide whether we want our own lives to be brutal and bitter as well. Each of us has political views, many of them strongly held. Each of us is convinced that we are right. My uncle was a professor. At and some of us might well be. But if we let these views dominate our thoughts, our time, our conversations, they will harm our relationships and happiness. We can be happier if sometimes we follow the Buddha or Christ or Muhammad or whoever and just let our opinions go. Let's let them go. Bye. Bye, opinions. Oh, look at them flying away. Don't you feel better now? Uh, I do. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Soldiers.
sailors and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force. You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are I hard. I shall not seek, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've I have I've never got. been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress particularly at this time with problems we face at home and to abroad. To continue to fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication would almost totally absorb the time and attention of both the President and the Congress in a period when our entire focus should be on the great issue of peace abroad. Therefore, without inflation. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour. Just think how much you're going to be missed in this office. You don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, Tear down this wall. Now, I have to go back to work on my State of the Union speech, and I worked on it till pretty late last night. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie. Not a single time, never. These allegations are false, and I need to go back to work it for came, the American people. And now it has ended. Resolved as it must be resolved through the honored institutions of our democracy. Now the U.S. Supreme Court has spoken. Let there be no doubt. While I strongly disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. I accept the finality of this outcome, which will be ratified next Monday in the Electoral College. And tonight, for the sake of our unity as a people and the strength of our democracy. I want you all to know that America today, America today is on bended knee in prayer for the people whose lives were lost here, for the workers who work here, for the families who mourn. This nation stands with the good people of New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut as we mourn the loss of thousands of our citizens. I can hear you! <laughs> I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. It has been the honor of my life to serve you. I do have one final ask of you as your president. The same thing I asked when you took a chance on me eight years ago. I'm asking you to believe. Yes, we can. Yes, we did. Yes, we can. 
Thank you. God bless you. May God continue to bless the United States of America. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. I pledge to every citizen of our land that I will be president for all Americans. And this is so important to me. I've spent my entire life in business looking at the untapped potential in projects and in people all over the world. That is now what I want to do for our country. Tremendous potential. I've gotten to know our country so well. Yosemites, Yosemites, towering sequoias. It's going to be a beautiful thing. Joe Biden is a dummy. Donald Trump is a person that's got some problems. <laughs>